Tell me about it. I've always wanted to see a ghost, or next best thing, a man who has seen one. It was one August about 1861, said the captain. The Old Mansion Down on Long Beach, that narrow strip of sand which stretches along the New Jersey coast from Barnegat Inlet to the north to Little Egg Harbor Inlet on the south, the summer sojourner at some one of the numerous resorts, which of late years have sprung up every few miles, may, in wandering over the sand dunes just across the bay from the village of Manahawkin, stumble over some charred timbers or vestiges of crumbling chimneys, showing that once, years back, a human habitation has stood there. If the find rouses the jaded curiosity of the visitor sufficiently to impel him to question the weather-beaten old bayman who sails him on his fishing trips, he will learn that these relics mark the site of one of the first summer hotels erected on the New Jersey coast. That's where the old mansion stood, he will be informed by Captain Nate or Captain Sam, or whatever particular captain it may chance to be, and if by good fortune it chances to be Captain Jim, he will hear a story that will pleasantly pass away the long wait for a sheep's head bite. It was my good luck to have secured Captain Jim for a preceptor in the angler's art during my vacation last summer, and his stories and reminiscences of Long Beach were not the least enjoyable features of the two-week sojourn. Captain Jim was not garrulous. Few of the bay men are. They are a sturdy, self-reliant, and self-controlled people, full of strong common sense, but still within that firm belief in the supernatural, which seems inherent in the dwellers by the sea. The old mansion, said Captain Jim, or the mansion of health, for that was its full name, was built way back in 1822, so I've heard my father say. There had been a tavern close by years before that was kept by a man named Kramer, and people used to come from Philadelphia by stage, sixty miles through the pines, to Hawken, and then cross here by boat. Some would stop at Kramer's, and others went down to the beach to Homer's, which was cleared down at the end of the inlet. Finally, some of the wealthy people concluded that they wanted better accommodations than Kramer gave, so they formed the Great Swamp Long Beach Company and built the Mansion of Health. I've heard that when it was built, it was the biggest hotel on the coast, and was considered a wonder. It was 120 feet long, three stories high, and had a porch running all the way around it, with a balcony on top. It was certainly a big thing for those days. I've heard father tell many a time of the stage loads of gay people that used to come rattling into Hawken, each stage drawn by four horses, and sometimes four or five of them a day in the summer. A good many people, too, used to come in their own carriages and leave them over on the mainland until they were ready to go home. There were gay times at the old mansion then, and it made good times for the people along the shore, too. How long did the old mansion flourish, Captain? I asked. Well, for twenty-five or thirty years, people came there summer after summer. Then they built a railroad to Cape May, and that, with the ghosts, settled the mansion of health. What do you mean by the ghosts? I demanded. Well, you see, said Captain Jim, cutting off a mouthful of navy plug. The story got around that the old house was haunted. Some people said there were queer things seen there, and strange noises were heard that nobody could account for. And pretty soon the place got a bad name, and visitors were so few that it didn't pay to keep it open any more. But how did it get the name of being haunted, Captain Jim? I persisted. Why, it was this way, continued the mariner. Maybe you've heard of the time early in the fifties, when the Powhatan was wrecked on the beach here, and every soul on board was lost. She was an immigrant ship, and there were over four hundred people aboard, passengers and crew. She came ashore here during the equinoctial storm in September. There wasn't any life-saving stations in them days, and everyone was drowned. You can see the long graves now over in the Hawken churchyard, where the bodies were buried after they came ashore. 
they put them in three long trenches that were dug from one end of the burying ground to the other. The only people on the beach that night was the man who took care of the old mansion. He lived there with his family, and his son-in-law lived with him. He was the wreckmaster for this part of the coast, too. It wasn't till the second day that people from Hawken could get over to the beach, and by that time the bodies all had come ashore, and the wreckmaster had them all piled up on the sand. I was a youngster then, and came over with my father, and I tell you, it was the awfulest sight I ever saw. Them long rows of drowned people, all lying there with their white, still faces turned up to the sky. Some were women with their dead babies clasped tight in their arms, and some were husbands and wives, whose bodies came ashore locked together in a death embrace. I'll never forget that sight as long as I live. Well, when the coroner came and took charge, he began to inquire whether any money or valuables had been found, but the wreck master declared that not a solitary coin had been washed ashore. People thought this was rather singular, as the immigrants were, most of them, well-to-do Germans, and were known to have brought a good deal of money with them, but it was concluded that it had gone down with the ship. Well, the poor immigrants were given pauper burial, and the people had begun to forget their suspicions until three or four months later there came another storm, and the sea broke clear over the beach, just below the old mansion, and washed away the sand. Next morning early, two men from Hawkins sailed across the bay and landed on the beach. They walked across on the hard bottom where the sea had washed across, and, when about halfway from the bay, one of the men saw something curious close up against the stump of an old cedar tree. He called the other man's attention to it, and they went over to the stump. What they found was a pile of leather money belts that would have filled a wheelbarrow. Every one was cut open and empty. They had been buried in the sound close by the old stump, and the sea had washed away the covering. The men didn't go any further. They carried the belts to their boats and sailed back to Hawken as fast as the wind would take them. Of course, it made a big sensation, and everybody was satisfied that the wreckmaster had robbed the bodies, if he hadn't done anything worse, but there was no way to prove it and so nothing was done. The wreck master didn't stay around here long after that, though. The people made it too hot for him, and he and his family went away south, where it was said he bought a big plantation and a lot of slaves. Years afterward the story came to Hawkins somehow that he was killed in a barroom brawl, and that his son-in-law was drowned by his boat upsetting while he was out fishing. I don't furnish any affidavits with that part of the story, though. However, after that, nobody lived in the old mansion for long at a time. People would go there, stay a week or two, and leave. And at last it was given up entirely to beach parties in the daytime and ghosts at night. But, Captain, you don't really believe the ghost part, do you? I asked. Captain Jim looked down the bay expectorated gravely over the side of the boat, and answered slowly, "'Well, I don't know as I would have believed in him if I hadn't seen the ghost.' "'What?' I exclaimed. "'You saw it? Tell me about it. I've always wanted to see a ghost, or, next best thing, a man who has seen one.' "'It was one August, about 1861,' said the captain." I was a young feller then, and with a half-dozen more was over on the beach cutting salt hay. We didn't go home at nights, but did our own cooking in the old mansion kitchen, and at night slept on the piles of hay upstairs. We were a reckless lot of scamps, and reckoned that no ghosts could scare us. There was a big full moon that night, and it was as light as day. The muskeeters was pretty bad, too and it was easier to stay awake than go to sleep. Along toward midnight, me and two other fellers went out on the old balcony and began to race around the house. We hollered and yelled and chased each other for half an hour or so, and then we concluded we had better go to sleep, so we started for the window of the room where the rest were. This window was near one end on the ocean side, and as I came around the corner, I stopped as if I'd been shot, 
and my hair raised straight up on the top of my head. Right there in front of that window stood a woman looking out over the sea, and in her arms she held a little child. I saw her as plain as I see you now. It seemed to me like an hour she stood there, but I don't suppose it was a second. Then she was gone. When I could move I looked around for the other boys, and they were standing there paralyzed. They had seen the woman, too. They didn't say much, and we didn't sleep much that night, and the next night we bunked out on the beach. The rest of the crowd made all manner of fun of us, but we had had all the ghosts we wanted, and I never set foot inside that old house after that. When did it burn down, Captain? I asked as Jim relapsed into silence. Somewhere about twenty-five years ago, a beach party had been roasting clams in the old oven, and in some way the fire got to the woodwork. It was as dry as tinder, and I hoped the ghosts were all burned up with it.' 